It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. I uh, hope everyone had a wonderful Mother's Day and a great weekend. And to all the hardworking moms out there who juggle careers, responsibilities, and, well, the, their endless love for their families, uh, your dedication, your strength, uh, your love are truly, truly inspiring. Uh, So I hope you were able to take a moment uh, on Mother's Day, celebrate all that you do, and know that your efforts do not go unnoticed. Uh, So I hope you had had some some joy, some relaxation. Hope Dad and the kids took care of you a little bit. Um, Now I, I, you know, I, uh, you know, Someone asked me what what'd you get what'd you get your wife for for Mother's Day? I said nothing. She's not my mother. That not the right attitude. Uh, uh, we had a lovely day. Uh, did did the whole dinner uh, with the, the in laws. Uh, it was it was a, it was a great get together. Uh, and my wife runs away to do her scrapbooking thing for Mother's Day. That that's the best gift, men, that you can give your wives. Let them go away. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear your thoughts. What did you do for Mother's Day uh, for your special uh, mother? I'd like to hear it. Email me, Rick, at the RickSmithShow.com. Uh, but seriously, hope everyone had a wonderful, uh, wonderful day and filled with memories. Uh, now, uh, let's start this week off with, with something interesting. Uh, the Sunday shows were full of... <laughs> oh, they were full of... <laughs> That's the right answer right there. Um, but I got hit over the weekend... Uh, a friend is writing an article, uh, and I saw it on the Sunday show, and it's this narrative that the Biden campaign doesn't have a message, uh, that they need to re-energize their labor base, uh, th- that, you know, the you know how can they, how can they save their, their labor messaging? And, and as I've said, look, you know, the, the reality is uh, Democrats have a really good message. They have done a lot. And look, the, the polling that we talked about last week, uh, on all of the things that Biden has gotten ushered through, the the historic investments and the massive legislation that he was able to usher through our broken system, um, is truly historic, and and transformational. And the problem is, is nobody knows about it. And as I was saying, you know, you know, the reality is, is Trump was masterful at messaging. Give give him credit. Uh, there's a guy who knows this, how to suck all the oxygen out of the room and make it all about him. To where a lot of my red hat friends believe Trump did all of the things that Biden has done. That he, Trump, he himself, rebuilt our infrastructure. Everything's fine. Trump did it. Uh, that he, Trump himself, reshored all this manufacturing and all these chip productions and all of these plants that are being built around the country. That's because of Trump. And, you know, of course, you know, you know, he, you know, he did all this work for the middle class and, you know, all this stuff that, that he talked about and talked about. And, 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 and did I say talked about? And he, and he talked about it a lot and had held weeks. There was, you know, infrastructure week every week and uh, manufacturing week. There are all these weeks and all of these photo ops and all of these these gimmicks and all of these schemes and all of this stuff. Not a lot of action. You know, when I was a kid, you know, you'd say someone was all talk and no action. That's Donald Trump. Now, the flip side of that is, is Joe Biden. Uh, all action, no talk. And the problem is, is Democrats don't do enough, you know, like the labor movement doesn't. Uh, they don't do enough of tooting their own horn. I'm saying, hey, look what we did. And then standing by it and being proud of it. The Affordable Care Act. I remember saying when when they were getting beat up because understand the right wing messaging machine, real powerful. They have the ability to set a narrative, and Democrats didn't didn't <sighs> understand. It's a street fight, man. And as I've said in the past, you know, in a street fight, most Democrats will offer to hold your coat instead of getting in there, balling up their digits and 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 swinging away. Even if you take a couple of shots, you got to get out there and you've got to you've got to swing away. Understand? Now the Affordable Care Act, people are going, "Hey, that that was actually not bad." 
We should do more. We should do better, which we should have been doing years ago. But first we had to go through that period of people finding out what it is. Because, well, Democrats don't have the messaging vehicle. They don't have the ability to tell their story unfiltered. We have a, a series of Sunday shows, you know, the Democratic messaging broken and how did, how did they reach the how do they reach the, the, the voters? Um, they rely on the mainstream corporate controlled media. You know, you look at you look at inflation. You know, I, I hear I hear everyone complaining, you know, inflation's completely out of control. You know, you know, the cost of meat is, you know, through the roof. Yet, you know, the reality is, is almost 85 percent of meat production in this country is is done by by four companies. Uh, you know, sodas through the roof. You know, it's, it's almost more than gasoline. Yet three companies control more than 90 percent of the soda market. Uh, cereal, same thing. You know, breakfast cereal through the roof. Yet three companies control uh, almost three quarters of of that industry. And we keep hearing about this, you know, air travel. You got four airlines control the entire thing. We've got all this monopolization, all this consolidation. And why don't we hear about it? Well, because you've got what? Six major corporations that control 90% of everything we see, hear, and read? Do you think we got a messaging vehicle problem? Not a messaging problem. They've got a great message. And the analogy I use, it's like, you know, buying your kid the greatest Christmas present ever. And it's sitting in an Amazon warehouse because there's no UPS driver to deliver it. This is where the Democrats find themselves. They've got to get out there and they've got to do the work. Look, it's a lot of hard work. Social media, you know, radio, TV. You've got to build the, the environment. You've got to get out there and do it. Uh, no one's going to come do it for you. I know my labor friends, a lot of them like free media, which means they hold an event and all the, the six corporations that control 90% of everything we see, hear, and read will then come. If we build it, they will come. No, no, you've got to have your own megaphones. And this is what the right understands masterfully, which is why they control and dominate talk radio which is why they control and dominate cable news, which is why social media is so overwhelmingly tilted towards crazy right-wing messaging. There's a reason for it, because they invest in it. They spend a lot of time putting it together, making it interesting and entertaining and, and, and worth consuming. And oh, by the way, they're coordinated. They're all reading from the same, the same, the same book. They're all on the same page in the same paragraph on the same sentence at the same time. Whereas Democrats, the left, labor, however you want to put that, um, they're, they're fighting fires. They're putting out fires. They're fighting individual battles, trying to win battles instead of the war. We silo up. I've got mine. You've got yours. We're, we're going to work, you know, on our thing. Whereas the right understands empire. They understand dominance. And we had better figure this out quickly because there isn't a messaging problem. There isn't a message problem that Biden has. Because again, he's done some, some really great stuff, really worthy of, of being screamed from the mountaintop. We've got a messaging vehicle problem. It's getting to enough people and the time and repetition that it takes to get people to go, oh, yeah, the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, actually did some stuff to help climate change. That 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 infrastructure bill. Oh, yeah, that's why this, this road and this highway is getting finished. Oh, yeah, that's why this is happening. You need somebody who's talking to working class voters and not at them or through them. And this is what the right believes. This is what uh, Republican-leaning voters think uh, that the right's messaging machine does. We got work to do, folks. Lots, lots of it. But I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, Rick at the RickSmithShow.com. I'm going to come back. China back in the news. We're going to talk about China hungry. Is this, is this a dangerous marriage? Back after this.
We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So last week, Chinese President Xi Jinping and the Hungarian President Viktor Orban held uh, meetings, uh, several days actually, that ended with effusive praise and pats on the back and oh, how they love, 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 love each other. Uh, now, understand, NATO, um, Hungary, NATO, they're they're one of the NATO members. Um so it's kind of interesting to see a NATO member uh, signing on to what the Financial Times reported as an all-weather comprehensive strategic partnership for the new era. And that that partnership with China will serve more than mere semantic importance. And you go, what, is, what does all-weather mean with this strategic comprehensive? What, what, what I guess it means, according to Xi Jinping world, uh, it means now that, that Budapest is now one of uh, China's members. According to the Financial Times, uh, they are now one of those countries that do most to support China's effort to get this, folks, to counter U.S. power and which are increasingly rewarded with investment, trade, and diplomatic support. And here to share some thoughts on if this is a big deal or much ado about nothing on my part, I've asked our good friend Emily Delebrie to come talk with us. She is the chief cook and bottle washer over there at uh, Horizon Advisory. Emily, thanks for taking time for us. Thank you for having me. Mostly bottle washer. <laughs> so uh, co-founder and uh, important person there. Let, let's go with that. Um, is this a big deal? To, to, or am I... Am I looking at this going, you know, a NATO member, you know, you know, kind of breaking away, China increasing its its strategic, uh, you know, footprint? Um, anything to worry about here? Um, definitely things to worry about. On the Hungary's relationship with China is actually super interesting, um, and this kind of closeness is not new. Hungary has for a long time now been one of China's main partners in Europe, and has served. Um, and I'll talk about this more, but has served as kind of like a on the side fall guy for EU countries that are closer with the US to continue to have relations with China. Um, and as like the bad guy in the EU who's going to keep advocating um, close ties with China so that the other countries can say that they're advocating for the opposite. Um, so in that context, this isn't surprising at all. It's not really a departure from the norm. Um, although that norm itself is interesting and a big deal. The one thing that is notable is the explicit nature of this. Hungary isn't trying to hide its close relationship with Beijing. And I think that speaks to a reality that the reading of the current environment um, with, the, with the EU, with the US, with the broader global environment is that it's okay. Um, and you can explicitly go hug Xi Jinping and say, we're your all weather friends, even as a NATO member and um, and EU country. Yeah, but it seems like, you're, you, is it possible to serve two, two masters, so to speak, to be on both sides of the coin, uh, a NATO member and still yet, um, well, I, I'm, maybe, I, maybe I just don't understand, but it, it seems like it's, it's kind of hard to be in both places then. The calculus from Hungary's perspective, and I think which is accurate, is that NATO is not going to enforce a hard stance on China, that there isn't the willingness from the EU or even from the US right now to say it's them or us. 
And that's like the biggest thing that has to change about the U.S. international posture vis-a-vis China is right now it's possible for countries and even NATO member countries to play both sides and not only to play both sides, but to play China's side, which is what Hungary is doing. And no one is willing to really step in and say you can't do that. So I shouldn't be too hard on Hungary. Uh, you're, you're saying that other countries get away with this as well, and we just haven't enforced it in any administration. Uh, you know, Trump, Obama, Bush, any of that. Yes, I think Hungary is a particularly notable example, but also what Hungary is doing isn't just Hungary. Like, they're buds with China um, with the support of Germany, for example, because Hungary's economic relationship with China lets Germany have an economic relationship with China and prevents the international organizations Germany is part of from themselves taking a stricter line on China. Um, so like you have to like you have to think about Hungary as kind of like the you know little sibling who's being like encouraged to do quote unquote bad things um, because it's convenient for the older siblings and that way they're not the ones that get in trouble. Interesting, interesting frame. Uh, now, the reason I, th- I thought this was important is I'm looking at you know this relationship uh, with China, but I'm also looking at the last couple of years, uh, CPAC, uh, Crazy PAC, uh, the Conservative Political Action Committee folks who we've come to know, love, and uh, mock here here at home. Uh, they've been doing their their conventions and their outreach in Hungary. In fact, you know, just not too long ago, you had CPAC Hungary 2024, where you brought all the all the all the crazies together there. Uh, for a, a future where, you know, it seems like Hungary is the is the model that they want to pursue here at home. Well, I definitely think like Hungary and the conservative you know, party or establishment in the U.S. have had good relationships like Trump and Orban um, had a great relationship. I think it raises that in turn raises really interesting questions of. If we had a Republican administration, whether Hungary would come closer to the U.S. or not. Like, is the U.S. conservative establishment going to use its close ties to countries like Hungary to bring them closer to the U.S.? Or are they going to go in the direction that those countries are and themselves become closer to China or closer to Russia? And I mean, in the same way that it's not really clear if you look at, you know, what past presidential policy on international partners and their relationships with China, what, you know, it's not really clear that they've forced the line and forced a them or us thing. It's kind of unclear how those close ties would or would not be used. So, you know, if I'm getting this right, um, you know, a move toward Trump and which I believe would be a move towards more authoritative uh, leadership, more, um, more dictatorial kind of control at the federal level here. And our friends and allies would be more rewarded for that same kind of behavior. Um, I'm trying to put this nicely. Uh, Basically, uh, you're playing in the dictator pond. I think a big question is also like, you know, moving up a level, what, how, how U.S. leaders use their personal relationships and their personal closeness to advance U.S. interests or not advance U.S. interests. Like, we kind of see it as generally, like, regardless of the other country and regardless of the administration, as a positive when a U.S. president has a good relationship with another important state leader. So, like, Biden and President Macron in France was a great example, right? That was espoused in media as fantastic. It was a bromance. Everyone liked it. But that's only a positive if that relationship is being used to make sure that that other country is acting in a way that's beneficial to U.S. interests, right? right? Like a partnership for the sake of partnership, if you're talking about international relations, there's no actual value in that. So it has to be used to bring that country into the international order and the international norms that the U.S. is trying to advance. And I think it's unclear right now whether that's what, you know, whether the U.S. is going to do that with dictators or not yeah I, I i gotta tell you i i'm i'm looking at this situation and i see i see all bad in the event that trump becomes president uh but that's just i guess my bias and i'm what i'm looking for is so i'm gonna say no no rick relax you know you know this is this is the the, na- the natural order of the international community you know we, we we have these these checks and balance and these things that work out and um but i'm not feeling all warm and fuzzy I think like 
You know, on this particular question, there could, like, I guess my point is, it could be a positive. It could be a positive in any of these things, right? If we have people in power in the U.S. who are going to leverage relationships, again, to bring countries back on their side, but that's not, like, we don't know that's going to happen yeah. at any point. And so, like, I think the even bigger question isn't, you know, what's this? What's their relationship with this other country, whether that be a de democracy or non-democracy? It's are the people who are in power in the U.S. going to use their relationships abroad and their diplomatic clout abroad to advance U.S. interests or just to be buds and to go to a path of least resistance? And that doesn't even seem to be a party thing. It's just like a leadership thing. Well, we'll see how this goes. I got an email I wanted to address with you because uh, I got an email from someone who said that that I'm I'm being hyperbolic and that I'm, I'm being hair is on fire uh, when I talk about trade with China. Uh, that they believe that, that China is, uh, our trade deficits have actually fallen. Uh, they believe that what I'm saying, or what we've actually talked about, is much ado about nothing, uh, considering that steel imports, they say, are down from China year after year, and that um, you know this imaginary threat of, of, of EVs and all of this, this dumping, that we're just, we're just uh, imagining what's going to happen instead of... Um, uh, it actually happening, and I got and my response was clear. I, I maybe all that is true, uh, but we know from the past what what China has done, and we we know what they're saying they will do. So it doesn't seem to me to be hyperbolic. But I did want to get your thoughts. Yeah, I think there are two questions there. The first is, are those figures true or not? And the second is, what's the actual threat from China, and how do we face it? On the first question. You can't just look at the direct trade figures with China. U.S. trade with China has gone down over the past stretch, a year, two years. But if you look at indirect trade with China, the figures have gone up. U.S. trade with Mexico has gone up. China's trade with Mexico has gone up. Beijing's really good at getting around the first order of our defenses. Good game of whack-a-mole. And, so, and so then you get to what the actual threat is and how you measure U.S. exposure to it. Right now, the U.S. can't make anything important without China. And right now, the business models of every major U.S. company or that makes anything, which is to say the foundation of the U.S. economy, depend on selling into China. And that means that China controls our economy and therefore controls our country. And we know that Beijing is going to use that control to hurt us. I, I, I got I to gotta have you say that again. Um, we can't make anything of significance without China? Buy me something. We can't supply our military without China. Things that we're sending over to Ukraine to arm them depend on supply chains that are tied with China. We can't make an electric vehicle, let alone an electric vehicle battery, without China. 90% of our solar industry is controlled by Chinese production. Any major strategic industry, China has worked to make sure that it has leverage over at least one key note of that value chain. Now, for those who haven't been paying attention for the last 20 years, you know, how, how did we get to this? I mean, you know, this is this is a major because, look, I remember a time where all the toys used to be made in the U.S. and all the bikes and, all, you know, everything. Everything was made somewhere in the U.S., um, you know, and you, you knew where that stuff was made. How, how did how did how so quickly did we go from the producer of the world to this dependent? Then We didn't value manufacturing at home. And China realized that they could take advantage of that to control global industry. And whoop, there it went. That and corporate greed, because, hey, there's more money over there and they've been subsidizing heavily. So this idea, and this is where I wanted to go with this, this idea that uh, it hasn't happened yet uh, is the same is the same rhetoric that got us into the mess that we're in. Oh, it won't happen. It hasn't happened yet. Don't worry. Uh, you know, Granted, we know what's coming, but don't don't worry. Just head in the sand. Yeah, 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 yeah. Again, because we don't value, right? Like not valuing production in the U.S., our ability to produce, that means it's okay to just make more money, even if that means shipping production overseas, right? Like that changes the calculus so that you let like your profit seeking or greed be what drives a shift in production. And it's the same thing with the like, it hasn't happened yet, right? Like our economy hasn't, I mean, it has disintegrated in a lot of ways, but like, you know, the country hasn't fully fallen apart because of China. 
I would argue there's a lot going on that's a huge problem and that's tearing our country apart because of China, but it's not like a one-to-one -one and we're in collapse right now. However, China controls all of our economy. And I would say that means that it has happened. That is not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the truth of the matter is it's what we know. And we've been talking about this for a very long time. And every time I hear it, I get angry uh, because I think about all my flag waving friends, and all my friends who wear the American flag shirt made in China uh, and, and all of this. And and I go, you know, there there is common ground here. There is something that could unite us if only if only we chose this instead of all the stuff that divides us. Yeah. And I mean, I don't get this right to my mind. And I realize like I'm a one trick pony, like I only look at one thing. But any major issue that people are talking about in America and care about, to my mind, like it's a function of China, like polarization that's you know leading to the current political whatever we're going to call it like chaos disaster i argue like why is that it's because our economy is stratified because of china and because we don't have manufacturing like environmental questions look at china look at their polluting look at their control over new energy value chains like it's all china and i don't understand how we can't just have everybody realize that their number one issue is probably a function of China distorting our system and attacking us as a country and then make this what we care about. So do you see this coming up in this election? I mean, are, are you see? I mean, we're sick. We're just about six months out. Um, do you see this, this being an issue at the front or sadly, as I, I, I fear uh, this gets pushed to the back because it's not, it's, it's not grabbing headlines. It's not what the Sunday shows are about. It's not what talk radio is focusing on. Um, I'm, I'm curious your thought. I mean, I think at the narrative level, to the extent that there is a conversation about policy, and I'm not sure there will be a conversation about policy, but to the extent that there is, yes, China will be in there. But I don't think, well, A, there's first of all, is there a conversation about policy? And second of all, to the extent that it's discussed, it's going to be like the mouth service, the lip service. People saying, oh, I did this on China. I did that on China by people. I mean, candidates. There's not going to be an actual measurement of actions. And that's what's been missing from U.S. policy on China over the past decade is we've been saying the right thing and we haven't been doing anything. Frustrating, angering. Um, yeah. But again, not not shocking, not surprising. It is where we are. Uh, but Emily, I appreciate the thoughts, uh, the input. Uh, I am sure this is something we will be talking about well in through this election cycle. So I appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Email me, Rick at the Rick Is she right? Uh, does everything go back to China? Is All of our problems. Can we trace that? Can we draw that straight line? I think she's right. I want to hear your thoughts, though. Email me, Rick at the Rick Smith Right back. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So I gotta tell you, I, I agree with Emily. You know, it's it's divide and conquer on everything uh China. And and you know, her statement that everything that we need goes back to China kind of is frightening if you stop and you think about it. The fact that we've allowed ourselves to become that vulnerable. And for a lot of us, you know, and, and look, I was not on the China bandwagon, never have been. I was never on the free trade bandwagon. I was never on the neoliberal bandwagon. Now, I've had labor friends over the years who, well, they've 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 played in those waters. And I remember meeting with a labor leader back. This would have been like 2005, 2006, that I said, look, you know, we want to take on the neoliberal agenda. And he looked at me, and goes, uh oh. Shh, some of those neoliberals are our friends. And I remember going, no, not our friends. Uh, it's the difference between dying a quick death and a slow death. Uh, and, and, you know, it's like the frog boiling in the water. And here we are at that point of realization of, uh-oh, not much time left. And a lot of work to do to undo the damage that 20, 30 years 
you know, 50 years of conservative economics has brought us. And understand, the right-wing messaging machine has been masterful on selling us the wonders of the free market while pushing for anything but. Uh, and bad trade deals that have, have taken our ability to abstain. So when I hear Emily say, you know, everything that we make of consequence, we're reliant on China for, that does not make me feel warm and fuzzy. Not even a little bit. So uh, clearly this, this to me, a, a an important issue in this election. But we're not going to hear much about it. The reality is <laughs> we're not going to talk about anything of substance. Why would we do that when we can... We can have infighting and we can have red hat, blue hat, and we can, you know, we can we can argue over stuff that in the aggregate, in the grand scheme of things, not not all that important. For instance, I got an email from uh, the, the Freedom Caucus. Yes, somehow they've got me marked as a fellow conservative. Uh, and they said, you know, I've been tireless. I'm tired of the spineless Republicans selling out our country. Understand, this is a Republican sending this. I'm tired of them selling out our country. Um, you know, former Speaker Kevin McCarthy and his establishment allies are dumping millions of dollars into a congressional race in Virginia to defeat conservative Congressman Bob Good, the chairman of the House Freedom Caucus. And he said, it's a, they're not spending money to defeat a liberal Democrat. No, they're targeting a conservative warrior. And you go, well, wait a second. Maybe maybe you, what you consider a conservative warrior is kind of the enemy. Uh, have you noticed what you have not done during your time controlling the House of Representatives? Oh, yeah, nothing. And our mainstream corporate controlled media, I don't know, spends enough time on telling us how much nothing conservatives have done in a, while, while controlling our government, while really holding us hostage. And look, as I said earlier, six corporations control 90% of everything you see here and read. Uh, there's the rare occasion that, that a program like ours breaks through the dominance of corporate media. But the thing that gets me is I look at that corporate media and the, the, the Sunday shows are always, well, it's like an orgy of, of, hey, how can I be your friend? And because, look, they need access. They do. And, I, you know, I understand this. They need access. They need to have politicians come on and, and pretend to answer questions. I get it. Uh, so while talking about the messaging issue... Uh, they also asked Republicans, because they got to be bipartisan in this, uh, will you accept the election results in, in November? What they're really saying is, if Trump loses, and when Trump loses, will you not do what you did in 2020? That's really what they're trying to ask. And they ask it in, in, in nice ways, like, will you accept the results of the 2020 election no matter who wins? And Lindsey Graham, you know, to Kirsten Welker said, yeah, I'll accept them uh, if there's no massive cheating, which means that you know, if Trump wins, then then there will have been no massive cheating. But if Biden wins, there will be massive cheating because that's the frame they're selling. That's what they're selling us. Now, they'll accept their own election results when they win. Of course. Yes. Yes. Of course, I won because I'm. Yeah, you didn't hear many Republicans in 2020 who won their elections complaining about how rigged the whole system is. Because here's the thing, and this is what I said back then. If Joe Biden was smart enough in his basement to figure out coding, to rig the election for himself, why didn't he rig the elections you know, of a couple more in the House and the Senate to get himself an easy majority to get his agenda passed through? I, you know, I don't know. I'm not quite sure. No one's been able to answer that. Maybe it was, you know... It, just an oversight didn't get that far down on the list but you know this is what we got from our sunday shows you know jd vance for instance was on there asked whether you know well, will you accept will you accept the results now understand he wants to be trump's running mate so he's he's gotta hedge his bets he's gotta he's gotta toe the trump line and his response was well if we have a free and fair election I will accept the results, which gives him plenty of room to back up and go, see, it wasn't fair. No, no, my guy didn't win. And that's, understand, 
That's the argument. That's what they're trying to push down our throats, that, that there's all this cheating on, you know, immigrants. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard this one. You know, the Democrats want all these illegals to come in so that they can all vote. And understand, non non-citizens can't vote. That's the law. It's already a crime. It's already a crime. But yet, but yet, understand, the Republican messaging machine masterfully frames this issue in Democrats are bringing all these people in just to flood the voting booth because, you know, evidently they're going to we're passing they're passing laws to let illegals vote. And that's the fear. The fear is all of the unknown that Republicans keep throwing out. Had a conversation with a relative. And it goes it goes like this. Hey, how you doing? Oh, the country's going to hell in a handbag. What's what's going on? You know, why why do you think this? Immigration. They're letting tens of millions and millions of people come through. And where are you getting those numbers from? Fox News. Okay. Um, did we have immigration before Biden? Uh, did we did we see this? Well, not like this. And go, well, the Reagan years, we saw a lot of a lot of a lot of immigrants coming that we've always had a constant flood of people coming into the country. Uh, we just had better laws, we had saner. Uh, center enforcement of, of things that we used to have a functional government that would pass something. Uh, do I think there's a problem at the border? Yeah, I think the problem at the border is uh, the rest of the world's riddled with poverty and we've done very little to help them. Uh, we go back to 2010, Republicans are like, oh, we got to cut off. We got to cut off foreign aid, uh, which truthfully speaking was how we kept people in their, in their home countries, uh, making them more tolerable to live in. But couldn't have that conversation. It, it turned into, uh, uh, you know, I, I know my talking points. And I'm like, look, I, I agree with you. We, we have an issue. How do we solve it? Do you have an idea? You know, what are they telling you uh, in your your little sphere? What's the solution? And it comes down to things that are you know, not, you're not going to be able to stop entirely. Uh, do I think we should have better border enforcement? Yeah, I've always said that. I don't know that giant walls work because we got ladders and and, and shovels. Uh, but there are things we should be doing. And we're not. Because that's not the point. The point is not about... And, and this is where, sadly, where we're broken. The point is not, is not about solving problems anymore. The point is pointing out the problem. And then profiting off of the problem. And then politically profiting off the problem. Not shocking that that we don't seem to to be able to do great things anymore because we can't do simple things. And you know, as I was talking to this 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 person, I'm going, look, you know, the sad reality is, is we are in in a moment where we this is the problem right here. I simply want to know what you're thinking. I simply want to know what you know, and I want you to share with me so I can understand where you're coming from. And he cut the conversation off, said, no, well, you're not going to change my mind. I'm not going to change yours. I'm going to get up and move. And I'm like, yeah, that's your right. Go ahead. I'm not going to hold you down and make you tell me. But that's the reason that we, we aren't able to solve problems. And look, this is by design. This is the reason that, that you've got such a dominant right-wing media to keep pushing a narrative that may or may not be true. For instance, I look at, at this Bernie Marino. He's running for Senate against Sherrod Brown in Ohio. Um, you know, he says that he's just a he's just a car guy from Cleveland, and he talks about how you know modest upbringing, you know, the immigrants coming to this country uh, from Colombia, you know, starting from scratch, you know, you know, a thousand people living in a two bedroom. I guess it was nine. People living in a two-bedroom apartment, they had nothing, uh, you know, you know, eating, you know, out of the tin can with a plastic spoon kind of scenario. Without saying that his family came from power and status and, and money in Bogota, uh, came from, you know, a pretty in, impressive background um, and, and having an upbringing, you know, surrounded with, you know, 
powerful people. Um, and those people who clearly has ties with today. So this idea that we left the home country where the rich and the powerful and the politically connected were to come to Cleveland and start over, you know, selling used cars you know, or whatever it is. Um, that's fantasy. It's, it's not reality. It's narrative. And that surprise is what Republicans do very well. All narrative reality light. And, and, and look, this is what, what Trump has done masterfully. They have spun a tale. They have spun a narrative that, that people, oh, okay. As I always say, you know, focus group tested, think tank approved. They spin these narratives and they throw this stuff out. You know, I think my favorite frame was um, alternative reality. It's an all, we have got an alternative reality. No, it's a lie. We used to call that a lie back in my day. Uh, and now the the frame that I, I've heard a couple of times is is dominance messaging. I've heard this one been thrown around a bunch. It's dominance messaging. Again, what we used to call back when I was a kid BS, but it's it's dominant. You know, it's 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 strong. And this is where the Republicans give them credit where credit is due. Uh, they always take the we're strong, they're weak. And Democrats don't do much to help themselves. As I said earlier, in a street fight, most Democrats will just offer to hold your coat. Um, this is where Democrats do need to, to ball up their digits and fight the right fights. Not everyone. I don't want them to turn into Republicans and, and lie for the sake of lying, but actually stand on firm, fact-based ground, which is Biden got four major pieces of legislation passed through, historic legislation that is going to transform this country. And you stand on that. You fight on that. Things are getting better. Where you hear every Republican, they're going to tell you the sky is falling. Joe Biden's the worst president ever. The sky is falling. Inflation's all his fault. You know, babies crying, Joe Biden's fault. And again, I come back to my Democratic friends. Ball up those digits, get in there and fight because you've got a good message. You've got the right message. We make lives better. We're fighting back against, you know, 40, 50 years of, of corporate attacks. You know, I've been seeing these frames on, on social media, you know, back before Joe Biden, <laughs> back before Democrat inflation. One income could support a family. And I'm, I'm sitting with, with amazement watching on how these social media uh, folks are, are rewriting history through, through, through social media, basically doing 1984's Georgia Orwell's 1984's Winston Smith's job. They're rewriting history in real time to fit today's narrative, which is, you know, one income could support a family and the reason it doesn't Joe Biden. And I'm going, wait a second. Uh, this has been going on for a while. And the reason that that we don't have one income being able to support a family anymore is because we've destroyed labor unions. At the height of the labor movement, 35% of workers were in labor unions, in the private sector. It's now down to about 6%. That bargaining power is gone. And what we did is we took pensions and we replaced them with 401ks in the hope that, hey, you know, you can be a millionaire someday. And instead of giving raises to people to, to be able to support their family, we gave, we gave their wives the opportunity to get into the workforce because desperately needed the money. And they've re rejiggered this and it's all Biden's inflation. And I actually heard somebody, you know, Democrats took us off the gold standard. No, that was Nixon. And, and we can argue whether that was good or bad or, or, or indifferent. But again, facts matter. Not alternative realities, actual facts. The reality is, is the moneyed interests didn't want to share anymore. The depression had worn out of people's memories. 
And they bought up media. They bought up every bit of influence that they could get to change hearts and minds. Time and repetition, they turned the working class against itself. And they did it, the new frame, dominance messaging. Because look, white working class male voters like me, strength matters. Dominance matters. Tone matters. And if you appear to be weak, if you've been framed as weak, that doesn't fly, even if you're right. And what have they done? What have they done to Joe Biden from day one? Sleepy Joe, he's weak, feeble, but he's gotten tons of stuff done. Now, I go back to this because I think it's important, where all narrative, reality light. The reality is, is for as loud and as, as dominant as they say they are, they're not helping working class people. In fact, their messaging actually makes people's lives worse. So when I tell my union brothers and sisters all of the things that Biden has done, his Department of Labor, his NLRB, the Federal Trade Commission, all of these things that have gotten done that our corporate-controlled mainstream media you know, just doesn't spend a lot of time on. And there's no messaging vehicle to, to constantly hammer it time and time again to repeat it like right-wing media does masterfully. People don't know. So the right-wing narrative flies. Biden's weak. Inflation caused all of our problems. They've spun it. So when a friend of mine said, hey, you know, how do, how do they jumpstart this? They don't. They got to build a messaging vehicle to compete. You got to be in the space. You got to ball up your digits. You got to fight. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. I'm going to take a quick break. Right back after this. Stick around. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1968. That was the day that workers across Paris joined students in a citywide general strike. College students had begun an occupation at the famed Sorbonne University earlier that May. These students were protesting what they saw as governmental repression in post-war France. A story by NPR marking the 40th anniversary of the protests described the situation in France, where women could not wear pants to work and married ones needed a husband's permission to open a bank account. Homosexuality was a crime. Factory workers could be fired at will. The news on the single TV channel required governmental approval. And the overcrowded education system was authoritarian. The students protested French leader Charles de Gaulle and the police. The addition of workers to the protest greatly increased its scope and impact. Paris and much of the country ground to a halt. President de Gaulle was able to weather the protests and keep his political power. By the end of June, most workers had returned to their jobs, but the country would never be the same. The protests of that spring became known as the Social Revolution. It was a turning point in the nation's history, and institutions from workplaces to universities would undergo a liberalization due to the protests. One of the most lasting images from the strike was a series of posters, simple designs emblazoned with the slogans and demands of those involved. One such poster called people to strike, declaring, Working now is working with a gun to your head. Another read simply, Factories, Universities, Union. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. Welcome back to The Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So it looks like I'm going to get into trouble with my Teamsters union again. Uh, and look, I'll tell you, I love my union. Uh, they've done amazing things for me. Uh, and as a 35-year member of the Teamsters union, uh, it's incumbent on me to want them to do better, uh, to want them to be on the right side, to right, want them to fight the good fight, to get out there and do the incredible work that they're doing in making lives lives better. But Oh, it's the messaging. It's some of the messaging. And this caught my attention. Uh, Teamsters President Sean O'Brien uh, here 
in a picture with Dana White, uh, the head of the UFC, the uh, the MMA uh, fighting uh, organization. And 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 look, you know, it's all fine, well, and good to you know take happy pictures because you like fighting, and you know, they they look they look very similar, they dress alike. Uh, I get it, the, the, the brothers, uh, brothers of another mother. I I, I kind of okay, I get it. And and I'm hoping this is one of those scenarios where. Hey, you're someone that you, you like the fighting, you like the, the organization, uh, watching on TV, uh, and maybe didn't know the backstory. Because, you know, I look at Dana White and as a union buster, because it's what he is. Um, back in 2016, 2017, we had some MMA fighters on this program talking about how they were being taken advantage of, the conditions under which they labor, and their push to try and join a union. Um, that was met with massive resist resistance. And what's interesting, and this is where this is where things get a little funny and weird. Uh, because back in 2017, uh, the Muhammad Ali Expansion Act was introduced. And look, the UFCW vigorously opposed it, spent millions of dollars lobbying against it to ensure that no, no, never gonna pass. The interesting part here is. In 2017, it was introduced by then representative Mark Wayne Mullen, who had been a former MMA fighter, was kind of personal in the bill, and and you know introduced this to to try and protect people like him and the fighters that he knew. Now, understand this was to expand. Uh, the Muhammad Ali Boxing Reform Act of 2000 that was passed by both houses of Congress, signed into law by Bill Clinton, as well as the Professional Boxing Safety Act of 96. Um, all of this stuff was to make boxing safer. And what the Expansion Act would have done, what the Ali Boxing Reform Act would have done, was made better contracts between you know the, the promoters and the fighters, uh, you know, made uh, promises on payments, uh, would have had some kind of rational uh, system on determining who were the, the the title holders and the fighter, the challengers, and the ratings. There would have been some transparency, some stuff. Uh, there would have regulated some of the interaction between managers and promoters so you can't have them both be the same, line in their pockets. And, you know, uh, you know, outright outlaw, you know, criminal plots and, and racketeering it would have it would have cleaned up the thing you know like like they had done for boxing it would have regulated it a little bit and again uh dana white dead set against it and again lobbied heavily and broke eventually broke the union and i uh, i i've reached out to the people who i knew back then uh to get them to come on and talk and we, we may get them at some point uh but i remember at the time that there was no fear that this would actually get signed because everyone knew Trump was going to to veto it had it passed because it had bipartisan support in 2017. Uh, now that Mark Wayne Mullen is in the Senate, uh, he, he I guess he has vowed to move it to try and move it, but with the House, hmm, not not so much. And this is where I come back to and I see this picture of President O'Brien and, and Dana White uh, mugging it up, very happy. And I ask, you know, does it matter that that guy's a union buster? Does it matter that the Teamsters president has used the power of that position to platform someone who is not a great guy? Not somebody that I think our union should be associated with other than trying to organize their fighters and organize uh, the workers in that industry who are making huge amounts of money for the Dana Whites of the world. I guess for me it comes down to the purity, and I've talked about this numerous times in the past. The old frame of which side are you on? This picture blurs that line for me. And I'm, I'm struggling with this. This is not an attack on Sean O'Brien, per se. This is, this is simply asking a question. Does this make sense? Is this something that, is this something that, that 
maybe he should have th been thought a little bit differently. Now, I, I read through the comments on his Facebook page, and everyone's like, yeah, great picture. Uh, you know, that's amazing. Look at two great people, all this, all this stuff. And it comes back to, for me, to information. Is it, is it a problem that I remember? Is it a problem that I remember that this guy did what he did? And then I ask myself, why don't other people? Because those folks who were cheering him on were union members. And I got to wonder how they would feel if the, the company CEO were mugging it up with, with President O'Brien like that. And what kind of response then would happen? I'm not sure. Uh, I would love to have President O'Brien on the program to, to, uh, to share some thoughts with us. Uh, he's always welcome here, as every Teamster uh, most certainly is. Uh, but I want to hear your thoughts. Does it matter? Should it matter? Or am I just much ado about nothing? I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick. Email Rick at rick at the ricksmithshow.com until next time this has been the rick smith show where working people come to talk so really that this story